Well, hey guys, it's Mandy with Sweetly Home, and today I am back, finally, to do the January chapter of The Life-Giving Home by Sarah and Sally Clarkson. You guys are loving this book, and I am too. It is just so rich and so full of such good life wisdom in how to make our homes life-giving and awesome for the people who come through our doors, as well as ourselves. So before we kick off today, I want to tell you about a couple places where you can find Sally online um, and some resources that she has available that may really benefit you. So the first is her podcast. I love, love, love her podcast. It is one of my favorites. It's called At Home with Sally. I will have a link and all of this information in the description box. Um, she co-hosts it with a gal named Kristen Kill. She also has a blog, and her blog is wonderful, and it's filled with amazing resources, so check that out as well. And then lastly, she also has conferences, so they're called Mom Heart Conferences, and the dates are coming up, I think, kind of soon, so she'll have those listed on her website. I know there's a lot that are out Midwest, so she's from, uh, lives in Colorado right now, so I know there's a lot around the West, Midwest, but I think there's one in England. Um, anyways, so check that out. Uh, apparently her conferences are just wonderful. Okay, so if you're new to this series, the way this book is broken down is by months. So part one has a couple chapters explaining about who they are, who Sarah and Sally are, some of their family culture, and how they created a life-giving home. But then they go through month by month, and they give practical tips and um, ideas for implementing some of these life-giving strategies into our everyday life. And read the title, it just... I was all heart eyes because this speaks to me. Creating a frame for creating a framework for home rhythms, routines, and rituals. And then this is a quote from Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote uh, Anne of Gar Anne of Green Gables, and this is from Anne of Green Gables. But the quote is, "Isn't it nice to think that tomorrow is a new day with no mistakes in it?" And Miss Stacy says that to Anne and Anna Green Gables, which is a really great movie if you haven't watched it. Okay, so she starts to talk about the gift of a new year. And isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Like we are in the beginning stages of this beautiful new gift of a new year. And there's so much that can unfold before us, good and bad. Um, so much, so many lessons to be learned, so many things to partake in. It, it just, it does, it really does feel like a gift. She says, this picture has become a paradigm for all of my Januaries, a new beginning, a new year with no mistakes in it yet. Thank you, Anne of Green Gables, 365 days ahead with all sorts of possibilities and a variety of ways to invest the day. To have a new start every year is a gift to me, as I always want to do things better, clear out the old, bring in the new. January gives me that new start, the possibility of wiping the slate clean and starting all over again. Um, and then she says, home is your garden of life, so to speak, and you are free to order it and plant it as you will. Um, and then later she says, but that's not to say that all of your plans are going to unfold as the way that you expect. Making plans for a home, after all, does not mean that everyone will always cooperate or follow those plans perfectly. Sometimes, in fact, I used to wonder if the work of home building and investing in my children's lives made any difference whatsoever. Quarreling, selfish moments, and daily messes challenged my confidence that I was doing anything of importance. Yet, now I look back and see that the plans we followed, the rhythms we practiced day after day, eventually became the values that all of us embraced as a family. It didn't always seem like they were paying attention, but all of them breathed in the oxygen of our home ideals and have grown up to reflect the values we wanted so much to instill in them. There is no one right way to live life in a home. No one size routine or rules or order fits all. Homes with young children will be quite different from a single adult home. Elderly adults will order their lives different by different rituals than will single adults, young marrieds, or universal university students. But the more carefully we plan our days, the better our homes will provide us with freedom and enjoyment as well as purpose and accomplishment. 
Um, and then she goes on and asks a few questions. What daily rhythms will help me accomplish what needs to be done and enhance our relationships? That's something that I have recently asked myself and started to implement new things and I can tell you my life has changed completely. I'm very excited about it and I'm going to film a video on that very soon, like maybe right after this. <laughs> um, what chores need to be done each day? Who will do them and how will I make sure they are done? Am I doing something now that doesn't need to be done? What daily and weekly rituals will bring pleasure and mark important areas in which I can invest my moments? Um, and I'll just read one little thing in here. She says, I have learned to provide life rituals that bring energy back to my heart, mind, and soul. Saturday night movie and pizza, Sunday afternoon tea times, going out for dinner as a family every Friday night. Okay, so this chapter is packed, so I'm going to plow through here. So then next, oh, this makes my heart pitter-patter. She talks about a day for planning, and her husband would kind of shoo her out of the house and send her off to a coffee, coffee shop or to... Um, a hotel lobby, wherever she said she could get away, that she could just be free to think and um, and plan, and she would plan out her year. And Shane and I did that one year, and it was amazing, and I wish we could do it again. Um, we went away um, over uh, New Year's, so we were away part of New Year's, and it was just, it was wonderful. Um, I brought all my notebooks and my planning stuff, and we talked to his husband and wife about the things that we wanted to see for the year and I planned my business stuff and it was absolutely wonderful and you know there's nothing magical about January 1st that's my my gal pal Laura Casey says that there's nothing magical about January 1st so if you have not put plans into play yet let me encourage you to um, to do that to set some time aside even if, if it's just one or two hours and and plan and dream and think about what you want to see in this upcoming year okay so I switched cameras this is a 4k camera you can probably t I don't know anyways whatever <laughs> um, okay so let's talk about decluttering the soul so um, this I found so poignant um, so she talks a lot about like physical clutter, but then she talks about kind of, um, she says, perhaps it's because of my normal responsibilities of caring for my family's needs demands so much of me, cooking nutritious meals, organizing our schedules, cleaning and straightening on a daily basis, and, the home and homeschooling in past days, as well as ministry, writing, and speaking. The holidays, as much as I love them, put an extra load on top of all of that. Routines go by the wayside and cl clutter slowly takes over. So um, she talks about how they start to clear out the physical clutter in their lives. Um, her husband organizes the pantry. Um, and then she goes on to talk about some of the mind messes. And she says, this involves cleaning out my heart and thoughts, asking and answering questions like the following. Do I have any lingering feelings of guilt that I need to give to God? Is there any bitterness towards friends or family? Any resentment? Do any of my relationships need mending? Have I created any rifts between me and God that I need to clear up? Are there ways I have failed or disappointments I have carried that are draining my energy? Um, I thought those questions are so, so good to ask because while we can be really good about clearing up the physical clutter around us, it's a lot of times it's the emotional, it's the mental, it's the spiritual clutter, the um, mind messes that she calls it, uh, that really can derail us. So then um, she talks about how they plan for fun and so she talks about taking some time to put fun onto the calendar and to do things with friends and family. Um, play outdoors if you can. Take advantage of indoor entertainment um, like museums, concerts, plays, movies. Invite friends over for cozy hospitality. Decide who you might have over for mugs of hot chocolate and fresh chocolate chip cookies. Or plan a Frito pie night, which I actually love Frito pie. I haven't had it in forever. Um, cook your favorite kind of chili and combine it with small bowls of grated cheese, corn chips, sour cream, and onions, and you have a fun dinner for sitting by a fire. Bake some bread and simmer some soup. The kitchen is a wonderful place to be on a cold day. Um, listen by the fire. So then she talks about listening to books on, um, like audiobooks. 
around the fire. Some of their favorites were The Chronicles of Narnia from C.S. Lewis. Love those books. I read them as a kid. Love them. Um, the Tales of the Kingdom from David and Karen Maines and Ralph Moody's Little uh, Britches. Create a cozy play space with card table, tents, closet hideaways, and such. Um, find a way to bring outdoor games indoors. Hiding wooden painted Easter eggs all over the house provided our children with hours of play when it was too cold to go outside. So things like um, maybe like sensory bins and um, you can make cloud dough and all kinds of fun stuff like that for your kids. And then talking about meal times and then household routines. Um, so I'm going to talk about the household routines really quickly. She talks about how she helped to establish routines with her kids even when they were young. And as a mom of young little ones, that is something that I'm doing now. Um, having them take their dishes to the sink when they are done eating and to get their bath towels before bath and to pick up their clothes from, um, you know, wherever they left them, like the bathroom or wherever because they're little and they throw them everywhere. Um, but establishing those patterns now with them so that it's taking the load off me and also it's teaching them to be responsible for their own things and establishing those habits for when they're adults that they will just naturally take their dishes to the sink, they will naturally pick up their clothes, they will naturally clean up after they've made a mess. And so that's what she talks about. Um, she says that each afternoon around 5 or 6 o'clock I would gather all the family members still living at home and we would take 15 minutes to straighten the house. When the children were little, that 15 minute cleanup meant Legos back in their box, puzzles in zippered plastic bags, books in baskets around the room, and toys in closets. At a later stage in our lives, it meant coffee mugs and teacups collected and put in the dishwasher, books and papers and computers put away, and clutter stacked or stowed. Often I would put on soft rock music for our 15 minute straightening time, and when three songs were over, we would go back to what we were doing before. But starting the evening with a cleanish house made the evening much more pleasant for everyone. Isn't that so true? Um, and then she talks about the routine of a morning blessing. And when I read this, I was just like, oh yes, this is, this is something that we all can do. We all can do this. Um, and so she, tar she talks about, um, about morning blessings. So she started this many years ago, greeting each one of her children with a good morning. I'm so thankful for you today. Or how are you this morning, my lovey? Or I'm so glad you are mine today. You are a blessing to me. I persisted even in those times when the one when the ones I was blessing acted embarrassed or just too sleepy to care. Oddly enough, these words were the ones my children have told me they heard in their heads many years after they left our home. Loving words have the power to provide hope, encouragement, confidence, and energy for the tasks of every day. If you want everyone in your home, including the family who lives there, to feel welcome, consider how you greet them into the day. Your words don't have to be the same each day or the same as mine, and what suits your family and speaks to their heart, to the heart of each person in it will differ. Gentleness, not loudness, seems to suit our family the best, but however you do it, the habit of welcoming them each morning and affirming your affection for them really does help to start the day well. And I can speak kind of in my own experience with this. In the morning, um, when Colt wakes up, he has been getting up quite early uh, lately, probably about 40 minutes earlier than what he normally does. And he wakes up so excited, just so excited to be alive, which is kind of the opposite of when he wakes up from a nap. He covers his face, he's grumpy, he's not happy, he doesn't even want me to look at him. Um, but in the morning, he is like a sunshine. And those first few times when he was waking up early, I was not happy. Um, because that cuts into my time, like that's my time to myself, I'm having my devotion time. Sometimes my husband was leaving for work, it was just, he didn't need to be up this early. And I think sometimes in my reaction to him, um, he would get so hurt and he would run to his room and cry and it's not like I ever scolded him or anything I just wasn't on the same happy level as he was um, and I've changed that um, and his response is so much 
he's just happy. He's so happy to be awake. He's so happy to see me. And my response has been just different. And I have to remember that this is how he's being greeted into the day. I'm helping to set his tone for the day and ultimately my tone as well because I'm with him all day long. And if he's happy and he's joyful and excited, that generally means my day is going to be that much better too. And when he's happy during the morning, I've just found that I'm happier too. It's so much harder when he's crying and upset um, to calm him down and that takes time away from me. He actually just plays in his room so happily and I, you know, have my morning um, devotion time and he plays by himself. So, um, and Aubrey, when she wakes up, she's very cuddly and I'm not so much a cuddly person. I kind of like my space. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not touchy-feely, but she is and she needs that physical attention and I would never deny that to her anyways, but, um, I have to remind myself that in how I'm receiving her love and her affection and how I'm greeting her in the day is going to speak volumes to her now even as a child but also will carry on to her into adulthood. I don't ever want her to feel rejected. So I put my feelings aside and I embrace her and I snuggle her and I love her and I speak words of life over her like like Sally um, was talking about and um, it's this little section of the of the book let me know okay I'm on the right track as a mom so many things I do aren't on the right track but this is one thing that I'm I'm sort of doing okay so um, I was kind of happy with that um, the next thing she talks about is um, the reading hour routine and she mentioned how she had um, baskets for each of her kids and inside were books so some books from the library of their own choosing some books that ch um, Sally had selected some were like poetry and some were um, um, like works of fiction and nonfiction and books about um, like characters and history and things like that so books to like really kind of expand her kids minds but also just like fun books and then during the afternoon they would have an hour where they would just set aside time and they would read. Um, and I think as we go on further, like as my children grow, I think I'd love to implement something like that as well because I know as a mom I have a hard time getting reading in, which is why these um, sessions happen like towards the end of the month because I don't have time to read. So um, uh, anyways, I I just I just love that idea, um, and it's a quiet time for everybody to sort of center down. And this little thing blurb here is something I was just actually talking to my husband about last night. Sally says, eventually, as the children grew older, I bought each of them a bookshelf and made sure that every Christmas or birthday, they would receive something new to put on their own personal shelf. I also bought each of them a small recliner or overstuffed chair for their rooms, so they would have a special place to do their reading. And how great is that? Um, reading that, I we have tons of books, but I really love the idea of being intentional about purchasing books for my kids. Last night I was just like on an Usborne um, book um, Facebook party, um, and I just I do I want to be more intentional to make sure that each birthday and Christmas I'm I'm buying them a book so that they can add it to to their collection um, and have their own little little space for for reading okay so this is routines for closing the day and then we are almost we are just about done with this chapter a couple weeks ago a friend of mine asked on on Facebook if you are someone that puts your child to bed or do you send them to bed and um, meaning by sending you just you know kind of kiss them good night and off they go or do you actually put them to bed you know tuck them in and, and sit with them and pray whatever um, and I said I mean my kids are young but I said I put my kids to bed and I will always put them to bed until they tell me not to and everything that Sally says in this chapter is exactly why I will always put my kids to bed um, Children, and even adults, um, are, it's, that t it's a time of day when everything is about to close down 
and it is oftentimes when our hearts are most vulnerable. We are going into a vulnerable state. Sleeping is a very vulnerable state to be in. You have no idea what's going on around you, um, and you just settle into that piece of believing that your world is at rest and um, your world is good. And I always want to be someone to put my children to bed and allow them to have that time to talk to me as their mom and um, have that space where it's just them and I and we can um, discuss things and they can share their fears and their struggles and their joys. And I've, as um, I have found that with Aubrey. I can ask her when she comes home from school, how was school? What did you learn? What did you do? I can ask her all the questions and I'll get answers from her. But at bedtime, it all comes spilling out. And I have heard the hurtful things that she's walked through during her day. I've heard the joyful things that she's experienced during the day, the mundane, the repetitive sort of things. Um, but it usually always happens before bed. And I consciously try and set aside time after school to like sit and be with her to hear her heart, but she's not ready to talk then. Um, it's always at night. And I, with Colt, who just turned three, he will not have anybody else put him to bed. He barely sees his dad and he lights up like a Christmas tree when daddy comes home and is so excited and wrestles with him and plays with him and has the most fun with his dad. But he doesn't want daddy to put him to bed. He wants mommy to. And um, it's just our time. We snuggle. I hold him close. I lay on the floor with him. We're under blankets. I, I read to him. I kiss him. We say prayers. Um, and it's just our time to connect. And I always just want to have that for my children as long as they will let me until they say, Mom, I'm old enough. And even then, I will still be there to knock on their door, come in, make sure everything's good, to just be a presence if they need and want to talk to me. So that is sort of um, how Sally did it. And I want to give you some practical things that she um, said here. And the way that they do their evening routine is exactly the way that we do ours. So for many years in our house, baths mark the beginning of the bedtime routine. And that's for us as well. We would put the kids in our big old bathtub with every imaginable toy, same as us, <laughs> whatever it took to keep them there and to give them a place to expand one last surge of energy. While they splashed, I would sit down to rest and read or have a cup of something just for me even if the dishes were still in the sink and the house was a wreck i would spend those few minutes restoring myself because i wanted to be available to extend a nighttime blessing to each of the kids um and she recommends you only do this with like children who are old enough no babies and toddlers I do the exact same thing, only I usually am cleaning up my kitchen, but I'm always watching YouTube and I follow some really like inspiring people and encouraging people um, and so that kind of fills me back up. And for a long time, sometimes I would be really stressed about cleaning everything up, but I've implemented some new routines and systems where I don't have as much on my plate um, during the bath time, so I have more free time to quickly finish that up and then... Um, and fill myself back up so that I can be there for my children. Um, once bath time was over, Clay and I would make would take turns making sure pajamas were on and teeth were brushed. Finally, we would gather in the living room or a children's bed, child's bedroom for a short read aloud from a children's storybook. This expected routine helped them to understand that bedtime and sleep time were coming, and that's exactly what we do too. Shane and I tag time tag team bedtime when he's here. Um, he gives them a bath and I do the cleanup and um, sometimes he'll get them in their pajamas or sometimes um, I'll just come in and, and we'll do it like right before bed. But we always read and this whole thing is exactly what we do. Um, after we read, we would send the kids to the bathroom one last time, then tuck them into bed personally, touch or stroke their foreheads, pray for them and kiss them. Every night we gave an I love you or I'm so very blessed to have you or other intentional words of acceptance and encouragement. The more positive and predictable the bedtime routine we found, the more our children went to bed willingly. 
and that's quite like our house too. Now it's bedtime, we would say. We have bathed, read, and prayed, and now you get such a privilege. You get to snuggle in your lovely bed with your soft, cuddly stuffed animals and go into dreamland. We always talk sweetly of their beds and try to make them seem as delightful as possible. We also made good use of positive peer pressure. When all the children worked in routines together, the younger ones tended to follow the routine without much of a fuss. And when we made a point and we made a point to praise them, you are going growing so strong inside. You go to bed like a big boy or girl. And I've been trying to do that with Colt too. Um, as our children grew older, the bedtime routine grew longer because it involved nighttime talks in their rooms. This routine of ending the day with love required a commitment of heart and time. I was often exhausted and drained, just desperate for some grown-up time, and a bedtime blessing was the last thing I felt like doing. Yes. <laughs> but I kept the routine going every night. I acted in love even when I didn't feel particularly loving, and I believe this was foundational to my closeness with my children. Somehow they all grew up treasuring that shared time together at the end of the day. Even now, it is sweet to see that when the older kids are home, they sometimes come upstairs to my bedroom, but now they put me to bed because now they stay up longer than I do. Anyways, I hope you're feeling excited about imp implementing routines and systems and rhythms into your life and to understand the heart behind it all. It's not to have a spotless home or to have a perfect life. It is the rhythms and routines to keep your family grounded and anchored and safe and centered and to have a place that's life-giving and that's what we're we're doing here so anyways I look forward to next month I think it's gonna be all about like love cuz it's February my favorite month besides October October is my favorite month but February 2nd because it's my birthday month. Um, anyways, I hope you guys have a really great day. Let me know your thoughts down below. Um, I would love to hear them and I will see you in my next video. Bye.